good morning. It's lovely to be here. Uh, so we're a little bit disorganised, but um, it's a joy to actually get this book finished and out on the road. I'm Jared Waterford. I'm a social worker working in narrative therapy. We work as a large team to sort of try to support the writing of memoir, particularly I've seen the Aboriginal people in Central Australia and elsewhere. And we do that as part of a you know, collaborative process that's often started from when people were working you know, 40 or 50 years ago sometimes. So there's been a lot of players in this story over a long, long, long period of time. And Margaret's efforts in getting this, her story and other stories told of, of local culture and traditions is terrific. And we're very delighted that she's here today. She's also got her brother here, Malcolm Heffernan, who's been a terrific help in getting the book finished and in supporting his sister through this process. And we're hoping he keeps on being engaged in sort of promoting and, and talking about this story. David Woods has worked very hard and, and, and he's still currently working with her. She does a lot of translation and interpreter sort of service with a group of women um, and men on Bible stories, on dictionary work and that sort of thing. Uh, Margaret M.K. Heffernan, uh, M.K. Turner at the end is the author of a book called... Do you want it? Sorry. You want it, Georgia? What it's like to be an Aboriginal person? Yeah. Yeah. A beautiful book, a local book that sort of talks a lot about culture. She's um, won the Order of Australia and is very prominent in leading a lot of the Aboriginal organisations in town and supporting them in their endeavours to get this agenda on the, book, on the page a little bit. Anyway, I'll, I won't say any more, but um, this is Franny Coglin, I'm Jared Waterford, David Woods, Margaret, Malcolm and MK, and we're all here to take questions. That would be great. Oh, David's going to read a little bit from the story just to introduce it. Touching on Margaret's um, diabetes and her stroke. I remember when they first told me I had the diabetes disease in my body. In the early days growing up, I never thought of going to see a white doctor to get a checkup. They didn't exist for us. Doctors were only at the hospital, nowhere else. And my experience of doctors as a young woman in hospital recovering from my burns and with Gilbert's birth were terrifying. They were just bosses that got nurses to do painful things to you. It was nothing something. It's not something that made me want to talk to any doctor or even nurses again. Even the mission hospital had been a scary place, so I didn't use the white medical system. We had our own healers. My father and lots of my family had died after white medical treatment. So I never heard about diabetes. I never went to the mission clinic. And I thought I was healthy and living a good life. But in 1986, I nearly died. It was only after that and being tested at the Alice Springs Hospital that I was told about my diabetes. I got better then, got very sick again when I was giving birth to Lloydie. Before Lloyd's birth, I had been working very hard at the mission school and going to IAD, keeping things together. I was getting very tired in the classroom all the time. I thought it was just being pregnant. It was in a way gestational diabetes, they call it. During the birth, it got worse. Afterwards, for a while, I was too tired to do anything for myself. But when I went home to, to the mission, I was looked after by our old midwives and healers. They got me stronger, making me eat good bush food. So after a bit of rest, I got up and got going again. Then in 1989, when I was living at Hidden Valley and teaching with the Yiparinia school team, my tiredness got worse and worse, and after a while I didn't even have the strength to get out of bed. I was sleepy and grumpy all the time, thinking too much, worrying all the time. My head felt out of control. My sister and family got really worried. Our healers came, found my pain and looked after me. But I didn't get right this time. I got very sick. 
They kept me in hospital for a long time. I couldn't do teaching or go to meetings. I just slept a lot, took lots of tablets and ate what I was told to. No more than three teaspoons, no more three teaspoons of sugar in my cuppa with sweet buns or biscuits for morning tea. No more cakes, scones or soft drinks. Too much sugar would kill me, they said. I needed to eat more vegetables and less fatty meat. The tablets they gave me, I had to take every day. After a while, I never took much notice of all the diabetes stuff the doctor told me. The routines around seeing the doctor and taking tablets dropped off. Even though I knew things I was eating and drinking in my daily life were bad for me, I could only cut a few things down at a time. Soon enough, I was back zooming around, doing things my own way all the time, like I'd always done. Except that I was getting older and putting a bit more weight, well, putting on a bit more weight. One day I was visiting my son Gilbert, who was in Royal Adelaide Hospital with a broken jaw. It was the 26th of March 1991, and I was nearly 48 years old. I remember that day very clearly. I woke up in the morning, early. No one else was awake. But I got up like I did every day, went to the kitchen to get something to eat, started to boil the water to make some tea for everyone. I was looking out the window, waiting for the kettle to boil, when suddenly I knew something was really wrong. I had a stroke. A terrible pain washed through my head, down through my body. Everything went crazy in my head. I started seeing funny zigzag lines in the, both my eyes, like I was looking at a broken TV. I felt numb and very heavy. I tried to move my leg to go over and sit on the chair. My f leg felt like a ton of stone and I fell heavily. I tried to get up, but I was numb from my head to my legs. I tried to call for help, but found I couldn't walk, couldn't talk. I tried again to get to the table, but the pain got worse and everything went dark. Then I blacked out. It took me a long time to recover from the shock of nearly dying. I was still feeling very ill and very, very frightened. I worried all the time I might have another stroke and die. I wondered whether I would see all my family and country again. I wondered if I'd lose everything, all the kids, all my family, all my work, my plans. I felt very sad and sorry for myself. I thought, why me? But then I thought about Lloyd, Joylene and all my kids. They were all too young to lose their mother. Lloydie especially still needed me. Plus I hadn't really spent enough time with my grandkids. I thought a lot about my own mother dying. I especially thought that I needed to get back home again. So I decided to live. My stroke left me without many, any speech. I was still very heavy and couldn't move anything on the right side of my body. I couldn't get my right arm or leg to move. When I wanted to talk, I felt so frustrating. I could only nod and grunt when the nurses and doctors asked me questions. I couldn't get any words out. It took me a long time to learn to stand up again. Later, I was able to get my leg to move a little and my right hand to grip things. I had to start learning everything all over again. Right from the start, I was introduced to my speech therapist. Sally was her name. She came every day to help me. I wondered if I would be able to do things like I used to. She gave me hope. First, she'd get me up from my bed, holding on to me little by little. She taught me to walk slowly away from my bed but it was a long time before I was strong enough to walk by myself. She kept walking and talking to me slowly from my room into another room to practice my steps. She also started, also started other exercises to get strength back into my muscles. The first doctors at the hospital had told me when I woke up that half my brain was dead. It got me thinking so hard, how can I get that half of my brain to work again? Like I'd tell my brain to move my tongue around my mouth, I could imagine what had to happen, but I just couldn't get my tongue to do it. I never thought much about my own language at rehab. When I finally came back to Alice Springs, I had to learn to speak it again. Even though I had all my own language stored in my brain, I found it difficult to make the sounds like NGK, KNG, K. N G W R R. Words like Akngara 
were very difficult. When I tried to speak, the sounds just didn't know how to come out. My tongue wouldn't always go to where I wanted it to. That stroke made me lose the ability to speak my own language. It was frustrating. Aranda was, has so many difficult and complicated tongue movements. When it was finally time for me to come back to Alice, I was so happy. My social worker told me, soon you were going home. My heart jumped with joy. I had been wanting to hear that for many weeks. I felt so excited about seeing my family and friends again. I never slept that night before I left, Ham said. They took me to the airport in a wheelchair. I still remember sitting and watching all the workmen loading luggage on the jet planes. Finally, our plane was ready to board and they started pushing my wheelchair towards the plane. The forklift driver came over and people loaded me into my wheel, in my wheelchair, taking me into the airplane and lifting me up straight into the doorway. I was so happy. A few hours later, I saw the McDonald Rangers come into view out of the window. I could see old Mbadwa, the land around the Todd River and Mount Gillen coming, welcoming me home. They unloaded me at last, and when they brought me into the airport terminal in my wheelchair, I saw my best friend Robin waiting and waving and welcoming me back. My eyes filled with tears of joy and happiness. I felt, I am home. My families here were waiting for me. My second daughter, Karen, was there, and she stayed with me. None of my kids had money to come to see me in Adelaide. I had finally arrived home in Alice Springs. It had been a long three months. Jared, the community health worker, was there at the airport too. He took me in a car to the Ipirinya Hospital to stay, Hostel to stay for a while and until a place that would be easy for me to come could be found. Some months later, I moved into a house, but no equipment had been put in to make it easier for me. Territory housing was supposed to install proper disability taps disability kitchen equipment and rails in the toilet and bathrooms to make things possible. Jared complained, but it was no good humbugging them. No good even talking if the doctors and physiotherapists growled them. Housing just got crankier if you complained. I've been in three public houses since then. I had my stroke. None of them had the proper equipment for people with walking or other disability problems. Housing kept us helpless. Lloydie and I and all the young grandkids, sorry, Lloydie and all the young grandkids sometimes came to stay. They drew on the walls, ran around wildly. The dogs were even wilder. It was good for me to hear the noise and have that energy around me, but the housing mob didn't like it at all. We had to clean all the time. My family and friends hadn't ever been so sick. They didn't know what it's like to feel alone and sorry for yourself all day. I couldn't talk much. I walked really slowly. I got tired easily and I was cranky sometimes. So I wasn't always a fun person to hang around and I didn't want anyone's pity. So I would tell people off if they started saying things that make out they were feeling sorry for me. People were busy and became a bit scared of coming to see me. It was like old people in a nursing home. I know that story too. Everyone says they'll visit, but it doesn't really happen much without a car. And after a while, I really started missing all the family visits and the busyness of the camps. I missed working and all the people coming and going. I missed being in the center of things and spending my time in places where there was lots of talking, drinking cups of tea, laughing and telling stories. I even missed the dogs fighting and people arguing all the time. The physiotherapist started worrying. Then they said I was getting lazier, but everything was a long way and I needed to get someone to push or drive me around. It was easier for them, but the physios were telling me that I was not walking enough by myself. If I didn't keep using my legs, they would stop, not, they would stop working at, or, at all for me. What I really missed was going to work and catching up with everyone. I was becoming a poor thing instead of being a provider and a mother. Just another person that had to spend time helping. They had to spend time helping. We didn't share many laughs or have much fun and my spirit was very sad. 
When David Wilkins, my fraud friend from Yuparinya, was visiting Alice Springs in 1992, he came to see me. We'd worked closely when we were struggling to establish Yuparinja's school. He took me to talk with Alice and Baldock at Community Health, and we caught up with the Aboriginal linguists and interpreters who were working at Mbantua under a dictionary project. All my old friends said that they had been too scared to ask me to come back. But when Alison and David explained that I would be all right and that the linguistic work would be good for me, they cheered up. David talked about how I could use the text machine and hand signals. Everyone was pleased. We talked to the dictionary project managers and they were happy to offer me a return to work trial to see if how I went. It was arranged I would be picked up every day to see if I could come to work. I was busting to start. Work was best treatment that happened to me. It combined my speech pathology and physiotherapy. I was practicing and thinking about my speaking all the time. And because I was happy, I was doing my physio exercises at work. It was much better than winning at bingo. My work friends made me feel I was useful again. Best of all, I was back with my friends being told all the gossip and being teased. I was laughing and having fun again, and all I had, oh, and I had something important to let get me out of bed in the morning. It helped me make big improvements in my speech too. Being busy was the best of all therapies. I wasn't so heavy and sad, and people started visiting me again. We're going to open it up for some questions as well. As part of that, we're, we're going to uh, also, if people want to know how we write the stories as a team and stuff like that, we're more than welcome to, we're more than welcome to ask questions on that. Savage from Canberra. Um, maybe that's a good place to start, exactly how the process is in this kind of collaboration where you work together to get these stories out on paper. Okay, so Margaret was very keen many, many years ago when she was working a lot with the linguists to write her story. So she started with, you know, with a whole different team of people linguists writing but as time went on she is a perfectionist everything has to be written several times before it's acceptable so as time went on people had to come and go and different people would pick up the story with her and you know in the, over the last say 10 or more years um, Jared and I have taken up that role we're not linguists but we have all the material from the previous writers and just continued to add on the story. It's very much driven by Margaret. Our, our process is pretty much to do sort of a family tree and get a really good idea of, of her family and who's important to her. And then to do a timeline, sort of trying to just sort of understand the various stages of her life and what she was up to. But in that process also tie in a sort of a social history as well. So, you know, what's happening in the world at large and what's happening in Central Australia, what's happening around um, Aboriginal history in this area. So for Margaret, you know, that the Land Rights Act, the development of Aboriginal organisations, the equal pay award that ended up forcing all the stockmen and their families off stations. Just sort of that's, you know, the mission histories, just how that impacted on her life and the life of her family. 
What we then tend to do is we put a whole lot of questions back to Margaret. We put it on the uh, timeline and say we're interested in what happened here and what you were doing there. And we do a whole series of questions. And if Margaret um, liked the question, she answered it. And if she didn't, she told us to not bother about that one really bluntly. And we've rolled on and rolled on over a long period of time. Ten years is a long time. We're narrative therapists. This was intentionally a sort of therapeutic process um, and important that we don't get ahead of Margaret in where she's sort of thinking through some of the issues. And I suppose at the end we had a quite a large sort of body of sort of work that was then edited back with her support and we had a lot of support from David, David Woods, who was doing work with uh, MK and a whole lot of the other senior women on all, all of these sorts of issues that sort of supported some of the editorial processes. And there were a lot of other people that sort of involved in that process, particularly Janet Hutchinson from New South Wales, who's a terrific editor, if you ever need one. And we had a contract with IAD that sort of supported it, Just somewhat, yeah. Plus, as much as possible, we'd also try and have family involved, like do readings with family and, you know, Malcolm, who was much younger than Margaret, have, he was always very helpful and thinking up stories that we may or may not be allowed to include in the book. And, yeah, just bringing in other people who were important in their lives. But mostly it had a sort of intentional sort of a, a fun aspect to it, you know. It was playful. It was intentionally sort of that. Um, and we did try to sort of make it, because Margaret herself is, is very funny and quite playful, really. So it was, you know, intentionally sort of written to make sure we kept with her personality and the way she sort of writes these books and she wouldn't let us get away with anything else anyway. Malcolm was a good help and certainly having family and friends around to sort of scoff and laugh a little bit um, and say that's not quite true but it's a sort of good story um, was always very useful. And Malcolm, as I was saying earlier, came up for the book launch in Darwin when we had it and has been available for lots of the events that we have and is a good field of questions and a very thoughtful man when it comes to culture and traditions and, and their her, uh, heaven and sort of family story as well. Right. Um, yeah, hi, thanks for that. Um, um, Evelyn from Perth, but um, I didn't catch the... Name of the book? Gathering Sticks. Gathering Sticks, Lighting Small Fires. Is the They'll be available afterwards if you want to buy one. And it had a lot of different names, but that's the one where we finally settled on. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, your story, Margaret. It's, it's just amazing. I'm Alirio Salarce, I'm the artistic director of No Strings Attached, Theatre of Disability in Adelaide, and we have a group called Tracking Culture um, that is all First Nation participants from all over Australia that had to move to Adelaide for different reasons, and mm -hmm. they're searching the court here and searching the language, but it's great to, to hear your story and, you know, um, at the moment, we're creating a project called Soundtracks to Our Memories, and it's how those first songs bring the memory of culture, of being in the community and being with the elders and all the, the um, indigenous First Nations language and culture and trying to bring that and keep it alive. And I just think it's so important to hear all these stories and all these perspectives because we need to hear it. And the voice is just great to hear it. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you.
Um, Carol here from Alice Springs. Thank you also, Margaret, for your wonderful writing and the very detailed way you have of writing is so uh, good for us to hear. I was wondering if Malcolm could comment on the process and how it's been for him and um, generally. Malcolm? It's good that she uh, wrote a book, but uh, I wasn't really in, uh, involved with it. He only got me at last minute when he finished the book and uh, invited me to go to uh, Darwin with her. And uh, really, I, I had no choice at all. Because uh, it, she had everything organised, and uh, she told she told uh, Franny about it and uh, Jared, and uh, like I said, it was a, it was a last minute, and I, I'm not trying to make excuses. What what about dialysis? I go to renal too. No, that's been arranged. <laughs> you can have it when you're down there. <laughs> With her, you know, with her, with, I mean, both of you can have a town in Darwin if, when you go down there for a week. So there was nothing I could do. <laughs> yes, trying to pull that up, pull out and make excuses, but yeah, everything was done. She, from my point of view, you know, I've got no choice. She's bossy. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. I just have to take her along. Which I did, and I enjoyed it, <laughs> getting out of Alice Spring, you know. I thought I'll never get out. Hmm. It was a, at one stage when we were writing the book, Margaret very nearly sort of looked like she was going to pass away. Um, and um, Malcolm is the Aboriginal palliative care uh, liaison officer and, and it is one of his roles that he sort of play, has played for a long time in this town. He's a very thoughtful man and he was a big part of sort of reading the book in the hospital and to a whole lot of the sort of family and all that sort of stuff um, and he has a quirky sense of humour himself. You know. so it was a lot of fun really and he's his sort of role in, in, in telling these stories is underestimating it. We used him all the time, really, when we could find him in his busy life. Yeah. Maybe, MK, do you want to make a comment about <coughs> the importance of these stories? Yeah, my name is Margaret Kamara Turner. Um, um, my grew up around Santa Teresa, and also uh, I'm a writer and a... Uh, a translator, an interpreter like Maggie. Maggie and I, that's the we worked in at, down at IAD together for a long, long time. And all the things that she was doing, it's very, very complicated language and also get people to say it properly and do it properly and to understand it properly. It's like, um, I was just thinking about when Woodsy was trying to say something about Angolia, Aulia, or something like that, and no, it's not that. And he came to me, I'm going to ask this question about the language. I don't know, I don't know what, what is what Woodsy. It was a similar name, yeah. And I'm not going to say anything because if I say the wrong name, somebody <laughs> it can, sometimes it can be a rude one, and I'm <laughs> surrounded by people who are all laughing at me. And 
the difference in sound is so subtle yeah. that it takes me forever to say yeah. the wrong one before I get the right one. But I think it was really good. I don't know how these people, uh, Brandy and Jared, did that book with her. They had to do it over, not this way, not that way, this way, you know, very, very old. They had to put it in place. I know Margie's way of saying it. But I'm very, very happy that she done that book. Yeah, Gathering Little Sticks with Fire. That is true. We gather... We don't get a big wood heap to make a fire. We start off with a little stick to make a fire. Get the gentle sticks to make that light for the fire. And and that's really good. So our children can learn. And I was so happy that she she got she written a book and somebody in her way with all those struggles in her life she came through and I'm very, very happy for you today. You're yeah, presenting your book here, Cheng Ji, and my little brother. And I'd like to thank Fran and, and Gerard and Woodsy beside her all the time, you know, to get this out. To get the, even she went to Darwin. I like what she organized all that. For little brother, it's amazing. <laughs> How can anybody do it? You know, you can't. it's already done. You can't say anything. <laughs> get in, get on the plane. It's just you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those sort of things, and I, and I just thought that's her. That, that's my sister, and I'm so happy. Thank you. I think um, it's amazing this morning just coming out of the Arante um, smoking ceremony and all of us feeling very grounded on this land to be addressed by European and Aboriginal elders from this land who have worked long and hard to do something amazing. And thank you all oh. for being with us this morning. Could I ask one more question? Have we got no time to ask Would you, One more question, okay. yeah. Um, Margaret... David Doyle introduced you really beautifully and uh, among what he said was, you know, for us to light small fires too. And I just want to ask what sort of small fires would you like us to light and what sort of changes would you like us to work towards um, in this country? Tiny, tiny little sticks, you know, kindling sticks? You start off with the kindling wood, and if you want to make a fire, yeah. Like tweets, you know, tweets of, yeah, those sort of things. Yeah, if you make a big bushfire, we'll have a big bushfire, and we'll, <laughs> nobody coming out. <laughs> Nowhere, you know. Um, yeah. Those sort of things, yeah. Treats from the tree, you know, dry stick, yeah. I think, I think Margaret sort of doesn't like talking in public on the microphone very much anymore. Um, she, it works privately much more effectively. But um, the book does talk about lots of those things in terms of disability care and the appalling lack of sort of accessible housing and the appalling lack of resources in regional areas. It's all covered a fair bit in that and we had a lot of time to sit down and sort of work through what those issues are and what she wants from the book and what people she wants people to take away in terms of working for social change and a bit of a justice sort of strategy. And education yeah. for young children. Yeah. Please join with me in, in, in thanking our panel. Thank you. Thank you. I think we also learned the, um, this morning from Malcolm about um, the absolute necessity of bossy women in our lives. <laughs> and I know that there, um, 
some fantastic artists with a disability who are extremely bossy in this room um, with us this week. And um, just remember, to keep bossing us. And I think um, this morning's panel also reminds us of the fact that we need to know and record and share honest, raw stories about disability. And I was really interested yesterday when Bree talked about the lack of documented history of the Australian arts and disability movement. And I really hope that academics like you, Bree, will pick up that work and, and start documenting it. And one of the things I think that was really lovely this morning is these guys talking about the chain of hands that have passed around Margaret's work for many, many years. And it reminds us that um, every artist needs a chain of hands around them. And I also want to acknowledge all those people who work behind the scenes in arts and disability who are here today.